I'm just going to give it one more minute for people to log on. So thank you for your patience and we'll get started shortly. All right, it is now past six, so I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome. My name is Allie Fisher and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and EDI Associate for Oregon Wild. To begin, I would like to include a land acknowledgement in this space. I would like to offer gratitude to the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. And note that I live on the ancestral homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. I'd like to acknowledge not only the forests, rivers, mountains, and deserts that those of us at Oregon Wild celebrate and work to conserve, but also places of art, industry, science, commerce, and community that are built upon these lands. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of Indigenous peoples on the land today, as well as historical events including colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. A recording of this program will be emailed out tomorrow and it will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org in the Wild blog. If you didn't get the chance to view the film, it will be available until Sunday night, so make sure to do that. If you purchased a raffle ticket, thank you so much for your support. This allows us to continue doing these presentations and the other work that we do. The raffle will be open for an hour after this webcast tonight if you decide you'd like to purchase a ticket. You'll have a one in, chan one in 10 chance of winning our Wild Pride t-shirt as pictured on the slide. I'll start with a quick presentation and introduction of our guest tonight after that, but please feel free to start popping questions into the Q&A. But first, before I do that, I want to know a little bit more about you all. So I have a very quick poll that I'll put up. It's just two questions. Um, so I'll launch that now.
All right, I'll just give it a few more seconds. So please um, answer the poll if you can. All right, and here are the results. Can you all see that? Perfect. All right, so we have a lot of people who are LGBTQ+, which is amazing. We have a lot of allies as well. Always love to see that. Um, and then it looks like a lot of people are also interested in just hearing more stories about the LGBTQ+, community, which is really great. And we have a climbing enthusiast as well. Um, and some that are all of the above. So thank you. I always like to do that um, just to make it a little more interactive. All right, so I'll get into my presentation now. Let's talk a little bit about this picture and what's going on here. So for the first one, we have gender identity. This is one's own internal sense of self and their gender, whether that is man, woman, neither as a non-binary or both. It transcends the binary of woman or man, as you can see in the illustration there. And it can also change over time and be fluid over the course of a lifetime. Next, we have gender expression. This is how a person publicly expresses or presents their gender. This can include behavior and appearance like dress, makeup, voice or body language, anything like that. Um, and then again, this can incorporate elements that go beyond the binary, which will be a theme um, for this presentation. So next we have biological sex. The idea of two biological sexes is very overly simplistic and misleading. Instead of saying biological sex, some people also say assigned male or female at birth. And this really acknowledges the fact that someone, often a doctor, is making a decision for another person. The assignment might not align with what's happening with a person's body or how they identify. And that's really important to note. For example, intersex individuals, this is a general term that is used for a variety of situations where a person is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit into the binary, that buzzword again, um, of male or female. Being intersex is also much more common than people actually realize. Estimates suggest that about one in two in 100 people born in the US are intersex. Lastly, we have romantic attraction. This is what makes people desire romantic contact or interaction with another person or persons. There's also sexual, emotional, intellectual, and aesthetic attraction, just to name a few. Again, this does not have to fall into the binary. And some people um, don't experience any romantic or sexual attraction. For this slide, I just want to, um, these words are mentioned a lot in the film, so I wanted to give some definitions of what's going on here. So we have transgender. Transgender people have a gender identity or gender expression that differs from their sex assignment at birth versus cisgender. A cisgender person is a person whose gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth. And then at the bottom, you'll see ally. So an ally is any person that actively promotes and aspires to advance the culture of inclusion through really positive and conscious efforts that benefit everyone around them. And those are three words that come up in the film quite often. So why is it important to share LGBTQ plus stories? Well, the truth of it is that being LGBTQ plus can impact the quality and availability of healthcare, treatment at work and school, financial, mental, and physical well-being, and discrimination really permeates into all aspects of society. And it must be noted that still 70 countries still criminalize same-sex relationships 
So the need for advocacy is really strong still um, and the need for strong allies. Here are just some facts that are taken from this year in the US, so 2020. Um, over one in three LGBTQ plus Americans face discrimination in the past year, including more than three in five transgender Americans. Over half of LGBTQ plus Americans hide a personal relationship. About one in five to one in three have altered other aspects of their personal or work lives. Um, and I've definitely seen that a lot in my life as well and my friends. Um, Transgender individuals faced obstacles to accessing healthcare, including one in three who had to teach their doctor about transgender individuals in order to receive appropriate care. Um, so that just really highlights why there is a need for really strong allies and why the work is far from over, um, even though there has been a lot of good progress. Um, yeah. So all of the factors that I mentioned before and many others make it hard for people in the queer community to come out and live freely and authentically as themselves in every aspect of their life. So here to talk about some of those issues and their experience and also um, being queer in the outdoors are our guests for tonight. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Devin. He's a director, producer, and writer. Devin is a gay Asian American filmmaker whose storytelling speaks out against the imposed silence he experienced from both his native and adoptive cultures since immigrating to the United States as a child. Devin has previously directed and produced 10 short narrative and documentary style films. He is currently in pre-production for an upcoming feature narrative, Half Sisters, the film and filming a commission feature documentary, The Road Home. Through his film production company, No Sunrise Wasted, he and his team also direct and produce other corporate and branded content. Next, we have Stacy Rice. Stacy is a transgender woman who found her way to Portland, Oregon from North Carolina over a bit over seven years ago. She was recognized in 2016 as a queer hero by the Gay and Lesbian Archives of the Pacific Northwest and is the former executive co-director of the Q Center, which for those of you who don't know, this is the largest LGBTQ plus center in the Pacific Northwest. Stacy's heart is filled every time she sits under a big ponderosa pine in the high desert or wanders the rim of Crater Lake pondering the universe. Next, we have Shanita King. Shanita is an intuitive artist with a passion in healing arts, energy, medicine, yoga, and nature. Shanita grew up spending time in the garden, playing in the ocean, drawing landscapes. As a self-proclaimed earth warrior, she believes that by deepening an understanding of the root causes plaguing our environment, she can help bring into fruition fact-based solutions that we can all achieve on a personal and global level. Last but not least, we have Ryan Stee, a fourth generation Oregonian. Ryan was raised on a small farm in a conservative lumber town in central Oregon. Growing up, he raised 4-H cattle, worked on the farm, and was taught the basics of being a man from his father and brother. From his mother, he discovered creativity and thoughtfulness. His respite from the rigors of the farm was to spend time in the woods. Ryan has dedicated his career to public service and urban and park trail planning. Who's on Top is an opportunity for him to explore the polar opposites that have shaped his life. All right, I can put my notes away. <laughs> so it's Q&A time. Let's see, there's a few in the chat already. So the first question, will there be a showing of the film? Yes, if you signed up um, and you got a link through Eventive, then you'll be able to watch the film. So Stacy, I have a question for you. Um, at the age of 10, you learned of another person that was just like you. What was that experience and how did it shape how you thought about yourself growing up? 
Oh, thank you, Allie. And thank you to everyone that's here tonight uh, with us. Really appreciate you being here and for watching the film as well. And Allie, thank you so much for the LGBTQ plus 101. I'm always a big fan of the genderbred person. So thank you for sharing that. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, in, I was 10 years old in 1967. Uh, and I, as you can imagine, growing up in back in that time, uh, you know, we had three television stations maybe in the mountains of North Carolina, of course, no internet. So I had spent a good amount of time since I was about five years old, just thinking there was something deeply wrong with me and that uh, I didn't understand why everybody saw a little boy on the outside, but I knew deeply inside that I actually was a little girl. And I didn't have the words to really share with my parents, you know, what I was feeling or I, I just, I really thought I was just the only one in the world that felt this way and that I must be cursed on some level. But, but when I was 10 years old, I luckily uh, found an, uh, an angel came to me, I like to say, or maybe a really lovely lifesaver. Uh, my family and I were traveling out to see my granddaddy's um, uh, sister and her husband out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we stopped at this little roadside hotel in Oklahoma on the way out, and we were sitting around the television watching uh, this news program, and uh, the, I could hardly believe what I was hearing. The announcer said, next we're going to talk to an ex-GI who is now a woman. And uh, if you know the term GI, that usually meant at that time in the 60s, that was male, a male person. Uh, so I thought, okay, now this is interesting. And so as they continued into the conversation, well, let me back up and say it was actually the person was Christine Jorgensen, who at that time was the most famous person in the US who had had what they call a sex change operation back then. And uh, here the, this reporter was interviewing her. She looked amazing and lovely. I could hardly believe my eyes. But then she said something that just really actually changed my life in such a deep way. Um, she responded to a question by saying that ever since she was a little boy, she'd always felt like a little girl. And I could hardly believe my ears. You could have pushed me over with a feather actually because all I could think of was, wait, there's somebody else like me out there. I'm not the only one that feels this way. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you how deep a bomb that was for my soul and heart, actually, to have heard that. Uh, I still didn't know what to do with it at all, but at least I knew that I wasn't by myself and that there was maybe a reason for this, but it took me a lot of years to find that out. But yeah, but she, uh, I like to think that, that hopefully she knew all the trans folks like myself that she touched because she shared her story. My God, she, she, uh, she had her operation in the 50s, 1950s. So that took a quite a courageous person. So yeah, she's kind of was my angel for a long time. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think that just highlights why films like Who's on Top is so important, just for people who are, you know, figuring out if they're queer or not. Um, just seeing representation is so vital. So thank you for that answer and for sharing that very personal story. Um, next, I have one for Shanita. So my question is, the film illustrated your experience as a queer Black person, and I want to know more about your personal queer history. Um, what has been kind of your journey into recognizing yourself as queer? And I feel like this answer might be helpful for anyone in the audience who is still trying to figure it out for themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity um, to share. Uh, the film and to share a little bit more about ourselves. Um, and yeah, and to answer your question about my career journey, um, I, I don't know, from a very young age, I felt 
as if I was different in some ways. Uh, I felt myself drawn to, um, you know, drawn to uh, other girls, uh, drawn to, uh, you know, having an attraction to uh, teachers <laughs> as growing up. Uh, and, uh, you know, just certain people I would see in media, it was more of an attraction towards uh, people that were more identified as uh, femme females and um but this attraction was something that I kind of kept to myself for a long time um and then when I was in high school um I had the opportunity to uh kind of confide in a friend who had also shared you know confided in me that she had uh, experienced attraction to uh to other girls and it was the first time that I had actually like had a conversation with someone um, that really like resonated with me on that level. And that allowed me to have a little freedom to kind of express that I had similar attraction. And, um, you know, it was just a way that we kind of connected uh, as friends. And then I guess it was maybe about a month later, uh, this friend, um, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine had a high school party <laughs> and uh, this friend invited um, another friend from her school. Uh, I should mention we went to two different high schools. Uh, she invited her friend over and uh, yeah, there was just like this spark that happened. And it was actually the first time that I, uh, but I kissed another girl and um, that just kind of shifted everything for me. Um, I was so excited and nervous about the experience. Um, I was also in, gratefully, I was in a party where uh, a lot of my best friends were there and I, you know, kind of confided in them about what happened, uh, this, you know, this romantic encounter and not knowing how it'd be received and they were all just really great and just kind of like oh well we suspected uh, <laughs> and uh and that was i don't know it just it just changed that one evening just changed a lot of my reality um and it took a little time for me some years a couple years later before i had the confidence to come out to my family and i kind of came out to <clears throat> excuse me, to family members that I was the closest with um, first. Uh, my brother, my aunt buddy, um, I shouldn't mention her real name is Mildred, but uh, we nicknamed her Buddy because uh, she was our buddy uh, when we were little kids. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just came out to the family members that was, I identified as the closest with. And same thing, it was just um, a lot of people just said that they had suspected um, and were just, you know, I was received really well. Um, now, as far as some other family members, that was not the case. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's people in my family that still are not as accepting or as uh, accepting, but with contingencies or limitations, you know, I should say. Um, and is something that, um, you know, as far as just from my experience and my perception, um, as far as um, specifically like the black community um, is there's, um, I don't know, there's a lot of area for more acceptance with people that are um, identify as queer, I feel like, or identify on the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so I see a lot of um, like it brought me a lot of joy uh, to see like a lot of media attention to uh, like Queen Latifah and to Little Nas. Um, you know, it's just something that maybe doesn't get talked about a lot, but there's definitely a lot of, um, yeah, there's, there's some work that can be done there. And I'm just happy to see that that's shifting and happening. And um, yeah, so that's, that was kind of, um, a lot of part of, <clears throat> excuse me, why I wanted to do this film was 
like you said before, um, representation really does matter. And it's something that um, just seeing people in my lifetime and just continuing to see people in my lifetime that I identify with or people that identify with me echoing, like it really can make a huge impact to our lives. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, especially as a BIPOC queer person, like seeing other BIPOC queer people, I'm sure is like just phenomenal, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm sure it's hard when people don't respect you for who you truly are, but if you do have strong allies, then, you know, at least you have other people to lean on and that's really, really important. Um, Absolutely. All right, Ryan, it's your turn. So um, we all know that Mount Hood's very iconic. It's just kind of in the back of Portland. Um, so you talked about this omnipresence of Mount Hood in your life. Um, how has being in this film really changed your perspective of the Portland landscape? When you look at Mount Hood today, have your thoughts or feelings about it changed since climbing it? Yeah, um, I look at it all uh, like almost every day and I go, oh, I was I was up there. Well, I don't wanna give anything away. I may have been up there. Um, yeah, no, it's, um, so I grew up seeing Mount Hood from Central Oregon. Um, there y'all all are. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up seeing uh, Mount Hood from Central Oregon on really good days. And it's always just been, the Cascades have always just been this dominant feature. Like our house looked at the three sisters every day and that's what we constantly saw. So it was always ingrained as, as uh, gave me a sense of place. And I lived in Arizona for um, 15 years and I really miss that connection to green and I miss that connection to those uh, snow covered uh, peaks. So when I moved back to Oregon, um, I, <clears throat> I would see it every day driving to and from work. I would see it every day from the places I lived and to actually, and I've always wanted to climb it. I've climbed St. Helens a couple of times and I was always like, yeah, I would love to climb it. I don't know, can we even climb it? And when this came up, I was already starting on a journey of, of uh, my own mountaineering journey and it kind of coincided perfectly. And it was like, oh, I get to do this with other LGBTQ plus people and um get filmed which wasn't like my main objective by any means because i have a hard time with cameras and questions um but uh it just turned out to be this really cool thing that not everybody gets to do and i finally got to be up on hood and um for for me like i mentioned there's been mentioned that i have severe pretty moderate to severe anxiety and there's just something where I feel really, really comfortable on the mountain and I just become at a place of peace. I, I don't really, I rarely experience a peaceful day, uh, a quiet day because I'm, because of my anxiety, I'm constantly thinking of a million things at once and prepping and over prepping and, you know, processing everything. So it's just non-stop and going on the mountain uh, especially hood because it required some technical expert, like some technical focus really calmed that all down. And I got to just exist quietly for a while. And that to me was, that's like the, been the best gift. And I kind of can't wait to get back up there and experience that again, if that makes sense. So um, I, I'm kind of proud when my friends from out of town come, I'm like, well, I'm just for, for y'all here. I may or may not have been to the top of that. You'll have to find out by watching the film. Um, but it's kind of cool that I can point it and say I may or may not have been up there. Thank you for Did that I answer answer. your question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I feel like nature just has this way of calming your soul and it's a beautiful thing. Um, so I can't even imagine like being able to summit a mountain and just the view that you get and the the piece that must be amazing. Do you, can I, do you mind if I add just a little bit more? Oh, go for it, please. So there's something lately I've been really experiencing is um, I've been finding myself with the pandemic and all the audience members may be feeling this, but I, I've been going out and hiking by myself 
just simple hikes just to get out to nature. And I find within the first five minutes, I get what I call hiker's high. It's becoming more and more apparent. And then I actually feel like mother nature is pulling away all that stress and all that, you know, the toxins of life. And by the time I'm done with even a short hike, I feel completely rejuvenated. I know, I think Stacy's felt that as well, um, talks about it, but it's, it is like she said, a salve for the, the soul. Um, so I encourage everybody to get out and get a little reparative hiking in or something. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Sell for the soul. I'm going to use that now. Stacy's. Um, it's Stacy's. Okay, Stacy, trademark. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, Devin, I have one for you. I'm just wondering what brought you to this particular concept for the film and what made you want to tell this story? Yeah, I wanted to thank everyone for being on the Zoom call. Uh, we're sad that we didn't get to see you in person at our, our Hollywood theater event uh, last month, but i um, glad you're able to attend and hopefully watch the film. Um, and, then, and then after that, hopefully this, or if you have already seen it, then hopefully my response will make a little bit more sense. But if you haven't seen it, please watch it and then um, then it'll make way more sense. But, uh, you know, as a gay Asian American immigrant filmmaker, I've really been drawn to stories that haven't been told before. I've been really kind of um, filmmaking my third career. So I've had a lot of time to really think about what I really want to do in life. And um, not just filmmaking in general, but specifically helping tell stories which haven't been told before. And um, my research showed that I, I, there wasn't another LGBTQ mountaineering film that <laughs> had been done yet. And so if anyone else has seen one, let me know. I'll, I'll retract that claim. Um, but, you know, as the first, um, and, and that's remarkable for us as an LGBTQ community member, right? We, we do many firsts as um, an LGBTQ person. You know, you're the first person in your family potentially to come out, first person in your friend group, first person, whatever, right? And um, really wanted to combine the beauty of the mountain, the, the visuals, um, it's, it, it's like a movie set. <laughs> Uh, I think Taylor has um, a, a quote in the film about how Mount Hood looks like a like a cartoon um, of a mountain, and it's um, you know it, it's has snow on it. It has a peak, and you know it's triangular, triangularly shaped, and the beauty and the grandeur, even from afar, draws draws me in, draws all of us in, and then to actually have the opportunity to be on it. It just seemed like uh, like a for sure like a Portland or like an Oregon bucket list thing, and um, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we started in the fall of twenty eighteen. <laughs> I can't even remember. Um, and then a year later, you know, we climbed the mountain. We followed these people for almost a year. And it was remarkable. It was, um, and in every step of the way, it was definitely a, a difficult journey, a long <laughs> marathon journey. <laughs> so glad, um, you know, got to meet these four amazing people. Uh, Taylor Feldman, who's a, a fourth member of the cast, she sends her regrets, she can't join us. Um, but yeah, it's got to meet these four amazing people. And then, um, I mean, this is now 2021. So, um, you know, we climbed the mountain in May, 2019. So years later, we're still talking about it, right? And um, I'll kind of finish with Ryan's quote from the film, which is, or I don't know if this is in the film, but um, I think we edited this out, but it was really about helping like the little Ryans you know, it, of the worlds, help them to have, see themselves on, on um, you know, on the big screen, right? And so that you can help one other person, then, then that's like, we've achieved our goal. And um, 
I've been so lucky with this film over the last couple of years, we've been able to talk to a lot of people through these panels, um, most of them virtually, but um, the last few times we've been able to do it in person since the, the restrictions have been lifted. And um, my guess is we'll probably continue doing this for a few more years. Uh, you know, luckily LGBTQ issues, there's, there's no expiration date. I'm talking about LGBTQ issues. And so uh, as long as people have us, we'll continue to, to show up and talk about it and hopefully engage more and more people and get more allies to help, um, you know, support the cause. Yeah, goes back to community building, building strong allies, um, representation. Yeah, that's all great. And you talking kind of made me think about another question. Um, Devin, if it's okay, I'll ask you another one. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of wondering what challenges you ran into filming on a mountain. That seems like pretty hard. <laughs> so if you could talk about um, some of that, that would be great. And then I'll I'll ask a question that everyone could pop into. Um, well, the most obvious one is, well, climbing a mountain is really hard. So I think that was an obstacle, just like the physical feat, <laughs> um, the journey of starting at 1 a.m. in the dark and in the cold and, go, and going up one, one foot at a time. Um, uh, from a filmmaking perspective, you know, there were multiple journeys uh, or there were multiple obstacles that were difficult, right? Getting the funding, you know, that was a big part. Um, making sure that everyone is adhering to their training, including us on the filmmaking team, you know, that we're also in the gym, we're also in the elevation room, because, you know, we had to go up with them. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> just give them GoPros and here you go. <laughs> we had to go too. So, um, I think that was definitely something that was especially difficult for us to manage. Uh, and luckily I wasn't one of the camera people, but on the camera side, they had to run ahead and wait for people to come up and then run ahead again. And that wasn't just for the summit, but it was for all the training sessions too, whether if we were on, um, um, you know, on uh, Dog Mountain, or at Timberline, which is a, a, like at another Alpine training or Mount St. Helens. Um, so we, def in terms of community, we felt very uh, a part of the project, even though we're behind the camera, because we were just there, literally the same sweat, blood and tears and, you know, thirst. <laughs> um, and then, um, I mean, without kind of, I don't want to cast like a negative light, um, but like making the film was really hard too, right? So getting the sponsors, we originally had a, a, a handful of more um, community partners, and then they ended up having to drop out for a variety of reasons. I think that was really disappointing. Um, you know, not to point any specific fingers or, you know, to like, they all had kind of had different reasons, but um, I think it's a reminder that, you um, from our perspective, you know, we do need allies and we do need people to help us. And luckily enough people stayed on um, overall to really help us uh, band together uh, and, and to get the film done and to get the climb done. Um, but if there were a couple of um, moments in our year long journey where it was like, uh oh, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> And uh, luckily we were able to overcome them and continue one step at a time, you know, up the mountain. Wow, that was a great ending. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you're able to make the film and tell this incredible story because like I've said before, the representation is just so important. So I do have a question in the chat it says, all four of the subjects are so photogenic and appealing. Did they really come together on their own or did Devin cast them or maybe invite them for the film? Who's that question for? It's you, I Devin. I think it's probably you, Devin. Me, oh, okay. Um, they are very photogenic. Right? Um, <laughs> on the inside and on the outside. 
and um, they were casted, but not casted in an unfair way. We actually had open auditions, open casting call, actually. You, and there were multiple rounds. So everyone was invited to submit. They had to write some answers to you know a handful of essay questions. Um, some people wrote yes or no to open-ended questions, like a one-word response when like you couldn't answer that question in that way. Other people like <clears throat> like Ryan, uh, <laughs> he wrote um, 500 words, you know, um, and he was really insightful and he was really vulnerable and he was very thoughtful, and so. Um, we had these different milestones. There was like that first round, and then the second round was like a phone interview that only, um, uh, you know, some people had to go through that. And then the final round was um, in, in front of the camera. So uh, I think that round maybe had like 15 people. And then from that, you know, we cut, we cut down to um, our final four. And um, you actually see some of that, that interview, that audition um, in the final film, actually. Like these people, they had to be ready to talk about their, their baggage in front of the camera. Um, we, were, our, we were only filming for a year, so you, I couldn't sit there and have our therapy sessions. Um, and then, a year later be ready like you needed to be ready to go sort of and and that i couldn't get people there right they had to be ready so um my my job was really just to create that space and through natural selection and through self-selection really on the on the parts of the the cast members for them and then luckily we all came together and um and yeah and now we have the film yeah, thanks for that insight into kind of the process, the behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of you for being vulnerable and courageous and getting out there and telling your story. So I have a question for all of you and you can just do it popcorn style, um, pop in whenever you want. Um, so you all talked about discrimination within the queer community how sometimes the alphabet doesn't get along. I'm wondering how this experience has impacted your understanding or acceptance of queer people whose identity and experience differs from your own. I kind of want to kick this off if y'all don't mind. Okay, um, so for me, I, um, I'm a fairly white guy, um, white gay guy. <laughs> Um, and my experience coming out well, has been always just really focusing around being around gay men. And um, the, the cities I've lived in have been mostly pretty, not segregated, but just a lot of white people, right? A lot of white gay people. So doing this was, um, and, and just, and I want to make sure I'm talking about also the G and the LGBTQ. I mean, that's kind of all I've, I've been exposed to um, since I came out. And um, a lot of our letters, I think, feel comfortable hanging out with their own group. And this was like, this was like um, the spice of life. I got to meet everybody. Um, I have my, my, um, I, I tease, but my, my Auntie Stacy, um, <laughs> Auntie Stacy's gonna go kick some butt. But like, I, I've met so many people from so many different um, letters and different um, backgrounds and different experiences. It's been, I don't understand how people can want to segregate themselves into just their little letter. It's so boring. Like this is, this has been an experience for me to start to see the issues. And I'm probably not making any sense, folks. So just bear with me. I eventually do most times. Um, this, this has helped me to move myself forward and also become an ally of the BIPOC community, um, for the, an ally of the trans community. And um, I've opened my heart and my friends' hearts have been open to me and I just am living a richer life because of it. I, I know that sounds a little corny, but it's totally true. 
Um, I've been living a much richer life because I get to connect with all the letters, LGBTQIA2S plus community members and um, our BIPOC community members. It's, it's awesome. Okay, I'm, I started it. Somebody else take over. I'll take over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shanita. Uh, it was very corny and very cheesy, and I'm also very corny and cheesy, so yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, um, just to echo Ryan, I um, also feel like this is an opportunity to kind of just enhance my life experience in, um, in a lot of really beautiful and amazing ways, and I uh, made some, you know, new friendships, and uh, I was just recalling, like, there were a couple times that we were all uh, around, sitting around together. Um, there were a couple opportunities where we were just engaged in really great conversation. This was not on camera. And we were like, this is, this is the good stuff. <laughs> you know, just like uh, having opportunities to just really be like transparent, really direct. Uh, we all felt comfortable with each other, uh, really um, to go there and had some really amazing conversations. And the conversations kind of um, gave, gave us the opportunity to kind of uh, do a little bit deeper diving, deeper exploration into, um, you know, our individual life experiences. And um, one of the things that came up for me throughout this process was um, not only the importance for uh, re representation and allyship and, you know, with the, that importance, like what is a call to action? And one call to action is that we all can do is leading by example. Um, you know, how are we as individuals, um, you know, be, being more inclusive, like in our friend groups, in our social circles, in the people that we spend our time with and connect with? And how can we um, diversify that um, and make other people feel more included into our circles? And so, um, yeah, this has just been a really amazing opportunity to explore things like this and to um, just kind of, uh, yeah, just lead by example um, in ways that I can um, with the connections that I have in my life. You know, one of the beautiful things of working five and a half years at Q Center, uh, the LGBTQ plus community center here in Portland, uh, was the fact that um, I could see firsthand how incredibly diverse the LGBTQ plus community is. Uh, it's not just about sexual orientation and gender identity, it's race, it's ethnicity, it, it's uh, age. I mean, we encompass all those things, actually. And uh, and sure, I mean, at times, you know, like any family, I mean, there can be, you know, some um, some difficult conversations at time within the alphabet, as we like to say. Uh, uh, it was, I find it interesting as a trans woman that, um, well, if, if you're a trans person, if you're in the alphabet, when you're in the alphabet, you're actually the only letter that's really solely about gender identity. Everything else is about sexual orientation. So that's always been a place for maybe some misunderstanding, uh, you know, uh, maybe non-acceptance. Uh, I mean, uh, it was, uh, I had a really sweet experience. Uh, I've been at Q Center for maybe a year, I guess. And I was sharing an office with, with a gay man and uh, he, was, he did our fundraising. And one day he just turned to me and said, Stacy, I just have to let you know that I am so happy that I'm sharing an office with you because I'd never met a trans person before. And I had all kinds of awful thoughts about who trans people were. And he says, but you've shown me, you know, just uh, show me what a trans person is. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, we're, we're a community, we're diverse, you know, and so, but we all, you know, when, when it comes to, to pulling together, we do an amazing job of that, actually, and uh, fighting for ourselves and our rights, so. 
I would just kind of dovetail that when that, um, you know, as LGBTQ people, we are always asking for allies. We're always asking for acceptance. And I, I, I definitely identified me personally. I, I wasn't doing that even within my own community. And so um, one of the secondary purposes of the film was really to create that intersectionality for us, for all the letters to get together, right? And if we can't do it within our own community, how could we accept, how do we, you know, why should, you know, non-LGBTQ people accept us? And so this was like a really nice test. <laughs> and, um, you know, for us to come together and, and learn from each other. And so um, echoing what Shanita said earlier, you know, in terms of leading by example, I, I think we um, are not able to take that into our allies and and be like, hey, I know a trans person, um, Stacy, she's really amazing, you know, whatever, right? I, I know a bisexual person and 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 um, we've just been so lucky and to have been exposed to each other and to learn and um, build uh, an affinity and um, hopefully um, the people on this call, um, you know, our interactions will just add to, to your understanding of the community and that you'll continue to pay that forward. Yeah, I feel like it's a ripple effect. Like the more events you do, the more allies and community members you gather. So I think that's a really beautiful thing. Um, thank you for all those wonderful stories. Um, it's really great just hearing all of these different perspectives and yeah. Like Ryan said, it's it just adds a richness to your life when you diversify the people that you hang out with, um, the people that you know. It just adds a whole other element to your life. It makes you more empathetic and understanding and just well-rounded. So I think that's a really great point there. All right, I think I have time for one more probably group question. Um, and then I'll wrap up the webinar because I want to be mindful of everyone's time here tonight. So my next question is, so a relationship with nature seems very important to all of you. Janita, you talked about stories in the land. Stacy talked about sacred space. So how has this experience of being in the film and climbing Mount Hood changed? all of your relationships with nature and the outdoor space. And again, popcorn style again. I could probably jump in on that, I guess. I, um, well, you know, I've always, I've always been in the outdoors. I mean, I, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina and lived a lot of, most of my life there actually. And so I uh, was surrounded by incredible nature hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, national forest land um, and see those mountains every day. So I felt like I had a pretty uh, awesome in deep relationship with nature. Uh, but when we started climbing Mount Hood, uh, I realized that I, there was still a whole different level to go to is that the fact that you're climbing that mountain, you know, in the middle of the night, you're starting and it's just one foot in front of the other. And it's the, the, uh, uh, the, the slope is unrelenting. <laughs> there's, there's super rare flat places climbing up to Mount Hood, top of Mount Hood. Uh, but what I realized, maybe not so much what was happening, but afterwards, the fact that with just that focus on the lamp, the light in front of you, one foot in front of the other, I realized that I had, I had found this old, whole deeper level of, um, of closeness to Nate, well, especially to that mountain. I mean, it was kind of like I was really just one with that mountain as I put one foot in front of the other and just seeing five feet ahead of me. Uh, and I found that incredibly lovely and wonderful, the fact that, that I could feel that mountain uh, all the way through my soul and heart. And that, and as we all know, I mean, Mount Hood is a, is a living, breathing thing. <laughs> and so uh, 
I, I thought I was I had gone pretty deep on my connection to nature, but uh, that just took me to a whole different place. So I really, every time I'm in, out in nature now, I feel like I can connect even deeper. And especially when I look at Mount Hood, I go, oh yeah, okay. There's my friend. <laughs> we, we hung out for a lot of hours. <laughs> so yeah, it was, um, it was quite a lovely blessing actually to be able to experience that. You know, um, what Stacy said, so I grew up in the woods. I grew up, you know, in nature. And I don't think it was until this that I figured out what the why was. If, if you guys understand what I'm saying, I finally understood what, what nature provided me. I finally understood, I had a deeper understanding of, of how it affected me and how it's helped me and how it's protected me and how it's loved me and how it's uh, kind of saved me um, from in many, many times, it's, it's literally saved my life in many ways um, from crumbling or, or that's a whole bunch of other stories. So it just was, this, I guess, clarity. It provided me with clarity of what nature meant to me and how important it really is. Cause it was always there, right? It was always there when I grew up and it was like, yeah, let's go to the Ochoco's and there's the Creek and, um, I have a deeper respect and uh, deeper, I guess, reverence for nature more so now. Um, yeah, so that's it, it just kind of took me to that next level of understanding and connectedness to nature. Wow, did that make any sense? Um, yeah, just to uh, kind of echo uh, both Ryan and Stacy um, also grew up uh, having the opportunity to explore different aspects of nature, hiking, canoeing, rafting, um, a lot of uh, more, uh, I guess you would say, southeast uh, <laughs> weather type of experiences, more um, warmer uh, temperatures. Um, and so this was my first opportunity to uh, Kind of just you know explore nature in a little bit different way and learn some new amazing new skills and um i found myself being drawn to mount hood uh shortly after moving here and had the opportunity to hike different parts of mount hood and uh this was just a really amazing opportunity to just um yeah just kind of echo stacy just deepen that connection and uh there were there was a moment when um, when I was on the mountain and uh, was just um, just overwhelmed with just looking up at the sky and just feeling like really overwhelmed and actually tears came to my eyes. Um, just having a moment of gratitude just to have the ability to be there and to have warm gear while I'm doing this and have uh, the safety of having these like tremendous guides and, you know, uh, just that level of accessibility um, was just such an amazing gift and an amazing opportunity. And um, I think that as long as I'm able, um, I will continue to say yes to opportunities that I have to connect with nature in as many ways as I can. Um, and so this was just, you know, just uh, just, yeah, kind of speechless, <laughs> but just, um, yeah, just a really special opportunity that I'm really grateful for. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that um, I don't know why Oregon Wild has whatever the tens of thousands of members and, you know, why the other people, why everybody else is on this call today. Um, I think we're all here for different reasons, right? And there's different reasons why we respond to nature and the wild. Um, I, I think how I would want to just tie all of us together is for some reason we do feel like we're called to it. And um, it's that sense and that connectedness and it's that through line which combines all of us together, right? And it's um, if we're if we're open to it, there's actually a lot of these three lines that we have with other people, not just people that are also passionate about the wild. Um, 
I, I think, um, yeah, I think that's something that I'm really challenging myself is like, how do I find that connective tissue to my enemies or my political people that I don't agree with, you know, politically or whatever, right? And um, it's much easier to just dismiss them and be like, well, they're not one of us. Um, but like, as someone as you know, that's in the minority, we, we can't have that attitude, right? So it's more like, how do we make it easier for them? How do we show by example? How do we lead by example and show like why they should care about us, why they should accept us and why is this us being at that table? Um, why is that important? And so that's a, kind of a call to action I wanna ask um, everybody else on the call is, um, yeah, try to find that when, when you meet or it, when you have an opportunity to, to meet with someone that you don't agree with, how do you find that through line and how do you move the conversation forward? Yeah, I totally agree. Like when you're out in nature, like everything is interconnected and we are part of nature too. Um, so I think that just being outside, you can learn so much and just, I feel like nature has a way of just taking you into the present and melting your worries away. This sounds so corny, but um, yeah, I, I really believe in like the healing powers of nature. So thank you all for this wonderful conversation tonight. It's seven, so I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Um, but this was a really great conversation, a lot of good perspectives and stories. So I just wanna thank all of you and thank you for everyone who tuned in today as well. And let's keep this ripple effect going, bringing more people into the community, um, more allies, more education and awareness and acceptance. So thank you all for joining us tonight and have a thank great you, rest everyone. of your night. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. We love you. Bye. 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 Bye.